The Hells Angels are notorious for their ruthlessness, violence, brawling, and sometimes even murder. However, they did not need to pull one of their stunts, habitually shocking people all around the globe, to make them even more famous. What happens when you lose everything that you have and all of a sudden branded as a member of the most idolized motorcycle club in the world, just not in a positive way? Your heart can shatter at that instant from dread. Well, this is what happened to a few Hells Angels members, who made some unforgivable mistakes that nearly endangered the club's existence. Stick on as we are going to unravel the deadly story of the men who almost destroyed the Hells Angels. On November 14, 2018 at 5.30 p.m., an innocent husband and his wife were found guilty and got handed the most brutal form of punishment, the death penalty at a Thai court. This news literally shocked people wondering how a perfectly normal family man, the father of two, was convicted of a crime. Actually, these two were not as innocent as they seemed. Luke Cook, a bar worker, and the husband of Thai citizen Kanyarat Wechepitak, was a close ally of the most wanted Hells Angels Ozzy Wayne Schneider, who attempted a smuggling of $300 million worth of meth from China into Thailand and en route to Australia. But the point is, how does a simple hotelier man get involved with the ruthless Hells Angels? Here is the story. The Australian government is pursuing drug smugglers more vigorously. Top of the list is Wayne Schneider, a member of the Hells Angels, who is infamous for smuggling massive amounts of drugs into Australia. He has eight outstanding warrants and 375 intelligence entries against him, but that won't stop him from operating his drug smuggling operation, especially now that he's found some innocent people to recruit. Australian police are continuing to uncover drug smuggling hotspots, and they discover Wayne Schneider's meth lab located in the Catherine Fields and Norellan suburbs of southwest Sydney. Wayne makes a run for it two days before the authorities obtain a search warrant for his labs. After boarding an aircraft to Thailand, Wayne made that country his new home. Two years later, Wayne meets up with another Australian fugitive after Australian police discover the labs, but by then, Schneider had already left the country, Bato Antonio. After Antonio was implicated in the August 11, 2014, murder of Mr. Dillon, a 25-year-old, he left Australia. A member of St. Michael Fight Club, a little-known organization in the Australian underground that Bato appears to really like, owing Dylan a debt that led to Dylan's death. Diego Carbone, Bonato's cousin, was scheduled to travel to Thailand with him, but he missed the flight due to technical difficulties. The police apprehended him and found him guilty of Dylan's murder. One would think that Bonato would turn to kickboxing as a means of self-improvement, but the criminal underworld has a way of hooking its tenants with thrilling activities. Thus, Bato quickly made contact with Wayne Schneider, with whom he had done multiple undercover transactions back in Sydney. By this point, Wayne Schneider had already founded a Hells Angels chapter. The two strike up a disastrous friendship in Paya, Thailand, where one would kill the other and the other end up on death row. Antonio Bato opened a gym again in Pattaya, Thailand. At first glance, Tony's gym appears to be just another place to work out and receive training, but there is more to it than that. Nestled among the shadowy nooks and crannies of the structure lies a sinister secret that will eventually lead Luke Cook to confront his own personal struggles, including an attempt to smuggle $300 million worth of meth, also known as ice. But how does a devoted father of two become entangled in the inner workings of a gang? To gain an understanding of this, let's examine Luke's background. Luke works offshore and owns a bar and a guest house in the coastal Thai town of Pattaya. When Antonio Bato visits his bar one day, he rents out a room on the top floor. The cook makes a mistake that he would later come to regret, yet they become friends and form a bond. Along with frequenting Luke Cook's bar, Antonio Bato and Schneider also hang out at Tony's gym with another Australian, Douglas Shoebridge, as would be expected from friends. When Luke Cook begins talking about his failing company, Wayne Schneider, the infamous Australian drug smuggler for the Hells Angels, recognizes a once-in-a-lifetime chance to him. The deal is set. Luke is to get $10 million from Wayne Schneider and import half a ton of meth into Thailand on his behalf. Amidst the pitch-black darkness of the night, a covert exchange is scheduled to take place in the South China Sea. Luke Cook is the ideal candidate to deliver his parcel because he is a perfect drug trafficker. He is married, has two sons, owns some failing businesses, 
and is desperate for some quick cash. Luke Cook, a boat and yacht salesman, is aware of his responsibility. His cargo is delivered far into international waters. A Chinese known as Jandi appears holding a sinister cargo intended for an offshore yacht within its freezing depths. However, this is no routine transaction, and Luke will soon discover why Schneider was unable to smuggle the massive consignment himself. It belongs to the notorious Hells Angels. It's debatable if Luke is aware of this, but the interaction happens Luke is given four yellow sacks with red Chinese characters on them. He is instructed to return to shore in the Seda Heap area of Chanbury province. However, while returning, a strange border patrol boat spots him, and he freezes as the border patrol tries to contact him. He quickly throws the bags into the ocean and vanishes into the shadowy depths of the night. But keep in mind that those weren't just any old bags. They contained meth with an estimated $300 million worth of cocaine headed for Australia. How is a bar owner and modest businessman going to raise that kind of money to pay back the dreaded Hells Angels? The cover-up captivated by the allure of hidden treasures is where the rubber hits the road in this situation. After the cook was apprehended for throwing the suitcases into the ocean by the border patrol, Shoebridge ends up on the yacht, his fate somehow intertwined with that of the cook. But as the hours passed, Cook's facade broke down, exposing a much darker truth through slurred speech and an aggressive haze. He admits to the true nature of their mission, that they were actually searching for hundreds of kilograms of the deadliest treasure of all ice, the crystalline demon, which ensnares minds and destroys lives. Shoebridge erupts in rage at the idea of being tricked into playing a lethal game. The knowledge that he had been duped and might have unintentionally contributed to the drug hunt eats at his soul. Cook is immobilized by panic. The clock is running out, their covert cargo half a ton of ice has vanished, and everything that could go wrong has gone wrong. This is where Antonio Bot's name appears once more. His old friend Bata will assist them in cleaning up the mess they've created, or will he let them discover it on their own? When Wayne Schneider learns of this accident, he immediately reacts negatively at his aptly named Clubhouse Angel's place. He tells people, you have to bring back my money or do the job you were assigned to do. Of course, a cook cannot raise that kind of money, so a deadly plan is hatched that will be captured on camera on Schneider's CCTV back at his Pattaya Villa. Let's go back to November 2015, when Sufan Fak Wang, a watchful security guard, is on duty. His job is to patrol and ensure the safety of the upscale Paya residential complex. As he goes about his rounds, he hears a sudden commotion and follows the sounds to a scene that will forever change his life. Five men, all but one hiding behind silk balaclavas to conceal their identities, are viciously attacking another man. This unhappy person, Wayne Schneider, is being forcefully bundled into the back of a white Toyota utility car. He is a man from Sydney's western suburbs named Blacktown, and he is known as Hell's Angel. Schneider was well known to the Australian Crime Commission, the Australian Federal Police, and several state law enforcement organizations for his production and distribution of large amounts of methamphetamine. He had risen through the ranks of the criminal underground. Three years prior, Schneider had left Australia swiftly after two large meth labs in suburban Sydney were discovered that were definitely connected to him by his DNA. This is a terrifying development. Schneider is being kidnapped. One man puts a shackle around his neck, another strikes him with a baton, and the others beat him with knuckle dusters. He is brought to a nearby home, where he suffers unspeakable horrors and is brutally bludgeoned to death. His lifeless body is then taken to the edge of the town and buried in a shallow grave by the side of the road. The perpetrators made a grave mistake when they rented a car with a tracker. Guess who was on the rental paperwork for the Toyota? Shoebridge's wife, Sripat Simat, whose husband is close to Luke Cook's and had attempted to retrieve the meth bags from deep within the ocean. After leaving the scene of the crime, the vehicle stops at Seat's residence before traveling 30 kilometers out of town. It remains stationary for two unsettling hours before returning to Siat's Pattaya address. Police officers decide to go to the place where the vehicle is idling. There are indications of recent disturbances in the secluded wilderness region where it is parked, and they follow the trail to a terrifying discovery. There is the lifeless, bruised body of Wayne Schneider, who was left for a while in a shallow grave. I'm not sure how long Schneider was in that room by himself, but from what I gather, when they returned, he had passed away. They then pulled his clothing off and stripped his body, taking him to the roadside grave for the investigation. 
she rented the property at Showbridge's request on behalf of another Australian, Antonio Bado. Little does she know that this would start a series of events that would reveal the dark secrets of the criminal world, leading to the arrest of Luke Cook and Bogota after the CCTV footage is made public. Bang God, the sole person not wearing a mask during Schneider's kidnapping, is found and taken into custody. It appears he crossed the Cambodian border and is staying in an inexpensive hotel when authorities inquire about his movements and assume who assisted him. Luke Cook, our man, told the court that he had taken a taxi and then a bus, getting closer to the Cambodian border with every mile that went by. However, Antonio was unaware of the complexity of the truth, which is significantly more than what his evidence indicated. In a separate Pattaya court case from the previous year, Australian Luke Cook was already entangled in the web of this chilling tale. Cook was found guilty of aiding and abetting his crime, helping the Bannett family escape to the Cambodian border in a private car, rather than a nondescript bus. Surprisingly, Cook's three-month jail sentence was suspended for two years because he had entered a guilty plea. The plot thickens further as another witness emerges. Tyler Gerard, a young man of only 22 years old, had first-hand experience with the horrors of that evening. With a voice full of fear, Gerard testifies that he was also in the vehicle that drove the Bagnat family to the Cambodian border. Luke chose to transport us to Cambodia. As he describes the circumstances leading up to their escape, Gerard confides to the listeners, holding their attention tightly. Apparently just a few days prior, he had suffered a broken collarbone in a motorbike accident. The terrible death of Wayne Schneider. Approximately nine hours after the kidnapping on November 30th, Antonio Bato called me and asked for my help to flee. He said he was scared and helped me with my arm because he was my friend. I helped him as the pieces of this terrifying puzzle fell into place. Antonio Bato had come to his aid, helping him find a hospital and extending a hand of friendship in their dire circumstances. The terrifying story of a night full of terror, deceit, and strange alliances continued to captivate the courtroom. The $300 million seizure How did the authorities connect the $300 million drug case involving Luke Cook and his spouse? To gain insight into this, let us review the police facts. Everything starts with a sinister scheme developed in the most remote regions of China, with the intention of flooding the globe with a lethal wave of drugs. Their nefarious ambitions find an unlikely ally in the infamous Hells Angels Bikers Organization, which is tucked away in the heart of Australia, to finance this evil plan. They resorted to Mr. Schneider, a mysterious man with ties to both sides of the law who served as the brains behind this evil scheme. With the click of a pin, he establishes a front company named Global Marine Solution, which appears to be a harmless front for their illegal activities. The yacht Jundi, which Schneider's company AC needs, has a treacherous intent. However, it was meant to be a journey filled with chaos and despair. Like a pawn in a deadly game, it changed hands and ended up in the hands of Mr. Cook and his mysterious Thai wife, Miss Canarat. Little did they know that this yacht would ultimately become the means of their own demise. The fateful date of June 15, 2015, loomed large on the horizon. On that day, the yacht Jandy, commanded by Mr. Cook and accompanied by Mr. Gerard, sailed from a marina in Pattaya. Their mission was to return with a sinister Chinese craft offshore and take delivery of hundreds of kilograms of crystal methamphetamine, a poison that could corrupt entire nations and souls. The yacht sails through the tranquil waters, unaware of the storm brewing. A routine patrol of the Royal Thai Navy intercepts their path like an unexpected tempest and causes panic. The crew must decide whether to risk being captured with the drugs aboard or make a desperate attempt to elude justice. They chose the latter and the bundles of narcotics in a moment of recklessness, plunging into the merciless sea and being engulfed by its depths. As a result of their activities, which have repercussions throughout the coastal areas, the authorities quickly track them down and begin an intense police investigation that will ultimately bring them to justice. In December 2017, Luke Cook and his significant other are caught at Bangkok Sabina Air Terminal while getting back to Thailand from Australia. What follows are four years of torment, misery, and a constant pursuit for equity. Luke and his better half get through a grim court barbecuing that sees them get capital punishment. They send off an allure that is foiled by surreptitious police processes that see them prevented from getting lawful portrayal. In the middle of getting this disorder, a dad's anguished weeps for equity rings out. Luke Cook's dad keeps up with the fact that his child is guiltless, 
and is just in the catches of the specialist due to a companion, K. Fu Douglas, who crosses paths with a Scotsman with a dim past who was once a partner of Luke Cook, and the fundamental observer against Luke Cook, is a human dealer taking advantage of weak spirits and bringing in African whores onto the unforgiving roads of Bangkok. Mr. Cook passionately guarantees that his child's capture and conviction were unyieldingly attached to the terrible exercises and dooming proof against Mr. Douglas Crossbridges. An examination into the demise of Mr. Schneider in New South Ridges discloses stunning associations ensnaring Shoebridge in the frightful torment and murder of the previous kingpin, the least house where Schneider's life had met a grisly end bore. The frightening engraving of show scaffolds perniciousness in the contorted embroidery of wrongdoing, misdirection, and retribution. The player's destinies stay unsure and the world watches in wonderment as this dim show works out on the global stage. However, as destiny would have it, a lobbyist gathering and two Australian parliamentarians beg the Thai High Court and request the arrival of Luke Cook and his better half, referring to a malfeasance. Their four-year difficulty reaches a conclusion, leaving them with peculiar repulsions and an everlasting suggestion to never screw with the damnation's heavenly messengers. Don't go along with them on the off chance that you're not holding anything back, or as they like to put it. The next story is of a man, in all the years that the Hells Angels have existed, who nearly brought down the entire organization. His story evolves from that of an inspirational motorcycle club leader to that of a traitor, driven by his dislike for the club to which he belongs. This man has solely locked up tens of Hells Angels members and gotten away with it. Who is this guy? And how did he do that? From being raised like any other child to working as a bouncer as a teenager, then rising through the ranks of the Hells Angels, David Atwell's life is the definition of a roller coaster. And it doesn't end there. David Atwell lived the life, but was different. My life with the Hells Angels and why I turned against them. His story switches gears when he becomes the highest ranking member to ever betray the Hells Angels. Yes, you heard that right. Why does he find it easy to take down numerous members of his former clan? In 1965, David Atwell was born in Scarborough, a Toronto suburb. He is raised in a loving middle-class household, and he does not consider joining a motorbike club until he has completed high school. At the age of 18, Atwell has already worked in various clubs as a bouncer due to his body build and frightening frame, and he decides to become a security guard. Atwell meets his mentor, Jim, who recognizes him as a natural and pushes him to pursue professional training as a bodyguard and security guard. In the late 1990s, while working as a security guard at the Falcon Nest nightclub, he meets a biker gang for the first time. Members of the Toronto Outlaw Biker Club, the Paradise Riders frequently visit the club, where Atwell works as a guard, and through his interactions with them, he is recruited by their secretary. Even before he joins the club, Atwell is popular among the leaders, who regard him as the epitome of a biker, and the vice chairman offers to sponsor him to become a member. That was bad. Woo -hoo! Woo -hooo! That was bad. bad. Was awesome. You had a, a great trip. Absolutely. You yeah, came baby. across the side to be here. There's about 3,000 motorcycles. That canyon ride this morning was bad. I yeah. That was all up. He's now known as shaky within the club since some members believe his chances of success as a biker are shaky at best. However, he quickly proves them incorrect after being promoted from a hangaround to the second level, a prospect. At that time, the Paradise Riders were a small club, so when the opportunity to join a larger club arises, the majority of them, including the leadership, accept it. In the 2000s, then-Canadian Hells Angels national president Walter Stadnick 
invited the Paradise Riders to join the club Patch 4 Patch, which means that all members retain their positions and ranks. As Atwell recalls, there was a vote and 51% of the Paradise Riders decided to join the Hells Angels. The other 49% could remain Paradise Riders, and many did. My friends were part of the 51%, so I went with them. On December 29th, 2000, a large joining ceremony was performed at the Hells Angels Mother Chapter Clubhouse in Cell. Atwell is late, and when he arrives, the president of Paradise National forces him to serve his new masters by wiping tables and providing drinks and food for the entire patch. The party heralds a new era in the world of outlaw biker clubs, since it is a mass patch over where 168 bikers from the Ontario outlaw biker gangs, such as Satan's Choice, the Vagabonds, the Lobos, the Last Chance, the Paradise Riders, and several loners join the Hells Angels. Overnight, Greater Toronto went from having no Hells Angels to having the most Hells Angels chapters in the world. According to Atwell, new chapters, such as the Ontario Hells Angels, are supposed to be subordinate to established ones, with some even learning French and speaking in French accents to impress the Quebec Angels. For Atwell, the adjustment is not without challenges. Despite being informed that nothing will change but the patches on their backs, they are not even obligated to pay the upper management 10% of their wages. He is too inexperienced and deemed unfit to even join an existing Hells Angels branch. Once again, the previous Paradis bikers must watch for him to be admitted to the club. However, according to him, he lacks the one thing that other Hells Angels have, that predator instinct and natural criminality. People who can take advantage of things like the fentanyl epidemic in Canada, they're feeding it. Following the bulk patch, Ontario now has 14 Hells Angels chapters, with Toronto alone having six, including the two Paradise Riders chapters. Atwell gradually gains respect as one of the top bodyguards and security guards in the chapters, and he is chosen for several high-profile assignments, including a meeting of the chapters to resolve a conflict with the Niagara chapter. The other Toronto chapters believe that the Niagara chapter is made up of people who aren't even bikers, and true to their claims, the chapter's chairman can't even ride a bike. The national chairman, Stadnik, is the meeting's mediator, and he explains that the Niagara chapter was picked exclusively for its monopoly on drug dealing in the Niagara Peninsula, making it the richest chapter. At the meeting, Atwell meets Stadnik, who he finds to be nice and cordial while also being very cautious and conscious of what he says. He says, being a Hells Angel is not like being a normal person. You get treated differently by everyone, and you get used to it pretty quickly. If I went to any bar in Scarborough, there would be no doubt that I was not going to wait in line, that there was always a great seat empty for me, and that there would be a cool beer on the table before my butt hit the seat cushion. Of course, there was never any talk of me paying for anything I couldn't have if I tried. My patch was like an entry pass for anything. I wanted a credit card I never had to pay off. But not all the attention Hell's Angels get is positive. My weekdays were spent rolling around Scarborough like some kind of nobleman, visiting the village poppers in my domain. That's really what it felt like because that's really how people treated me. The club doesn't just take over your life, the club is your life. Being a Hell's Angel is not like any other career because there is no off switch. Even when you're not with the club, you're doing something related to the club. You're a Hell's Angel 24-7 and the people close to you just have to put up with it. This offers a picture of how the Hells Angels build their authority, and over time, Atwell is drawn into the lifestyle, and things begin to fall apart for him. For the first time, he was caught by Toronto police in April 2002, while attempting to sell drugs to a woman who turns out to be a police informant. He is charged with drug trafficking, and released on bond for 20 months, during which time he accumulates significant legal debts and is obliged to return to his father's home to save money. When Atwell's security business discovers that he is a Hell's Angel, they fire him, adding to his problems. After being sent to an event attended by then Prime Minister Paul Martin, a security clearance reveals his association with the club, and he is sacked because the country is concerned about losing a contract with the government. On the other hand, his narcotics accusation stayed for nearly two years until February 2004, when the judge determined that the police did not obtain the warrant for the bug that recorded him through the proper means. After being cleared by the court and liberated from his work, Atwell devotes all of his time to Hell's Angels operations, 
eventually earning not just full patch status, but also ascending through the ranks to become the chapter's sergeant at arms. Immediately after getting his life back on track, Atwell is concerned about the position of the Brotherhood in the club, especially because he received little support from his chapter when detained and charged in court. At the same time, Royal Canadian Mounted Police RCMP officers approach him and attempt to enlist him as an informant, which he declines. However, it takes some consideration before he understands he wants out. He understands that it will not be easy and that he cannot simply give up, but only until the OPP's anti-biker enforcement squad reaches him. Project Develop In March 2005, Atwell is approached by the anti-biker enforcement unit with an offer he can barely refuse. After all, he is already tired of the club's unlawful actions and the loss of its essential ideals, and he is seeking an exit. He begins his work as a police informant immediately, as part of a program known as Project Develop, and while money is not a motivator, he gets paid $18.50 per week in exchange for critical information about Hells Angels members and activities. In September of that year, a fellow Hells Angel approaches Atwell with a plan to kill another police informant. This alerts him to the dangers of being an informer, and he becomes an agent informer, which means he is given formal contract immunity and a lump sum payment in exchange for testifying against club members in court. He insists on being an informant for moral grounds, and because Jim, his mentor, informs him that he will need the extra money while under witness protection, he receives $45,000 and his betrayal of the Hells Angels begins. His first significant assignment as an informant is to wear a wire and record a key Hells Angels asset, Mirad Bamman, discussing his submachine gun collection. While the Hells Angels have a strict white man policy, an Iranian immigrant named Bamman is allowed to join them because of his expertise in weapons, wrestling, and combat. He is frequently used by the leadership to get weaponry and carry out missions at a reasonable cost. However, the material that Atwell records is not particularly useful, and he is under pressure from the police to provide. As the search for the police informant escalates, Atwell is compelled to hide in the face of increasing pressure. Furthermore, the secretary and vice chairman are his friends who helped him join the club and even played major roles in his wedding, so he feels uncomfortable recording their chats together. He once recorded a meeting session in which members of the Angel Sudbury branch discussed joining the downtown Toronto chapter. However, only their leader, Lauren Campbell, is found worthy to join. Atwell befriends Campbell, and the two spend a lot of time together, including a weekend at Campbell's cottage in Baysville. However, he does not reveal his identity as a police informant. With most of the chapters interconnected, the exchange of information between them benefits Atwell's and the police, as he later records members of the Toronto chapter discussing a failed assassination attempt. The assassin is the sergeant-at-arms of the Angels London chapter, who attempts to kill a mafiosi. It fails at a Toronto restaurant where an innocent bystander is struck by a stray gunshot. Along with project development, there are other informant initiatives, such as Project Tandem, which is supervised by another informant, the Oshawa Chapter Treasurer. The Project Tandem raids take place on September 26th, resulting in the arrest of some high-profile members and a mood of paranoia that makes Atwell's job more difficult. His tendency to buy far too much narcotics from far too many sources at once attracts the attention of the Toronto Hells Angels bosses, who confront him and threaten to kill him if he is the informant. The next day after being threatened, his police handlers force him into witness protection and arrange a series of raids on Hells Angels clubhouses based on the intelligence acquired by Atwell. The information Atwell shares with the police leads to the arrest and conviction of 31 Hells Angels, as well as the confiscation of millions of dollars worth drugs. The Crown took time to develop a case in April 2007, and the trial took place between September 2010 and May 2011, with Atwell serving as the key witness. When Atwell takes the stand, he is nervous, and his credibility as a star witness is called into question. When one of the convicts, acting as his own lawyer, portrays him as a violent man, who had only become a police informant to protect himself at the end of the trial, which is now regarded as one of the longest in Canadian history. The majority of the accused are convicted of drug trafficking and illegal possession of weapons, and Atwell's life has changed forever since 2007. 
He lives in perpetual paranoia since the Hell's Angels are continually seeking for him to take revenge for his betrayal.